Good morning, everybody, and thank you as always for being with us. As people are jumping in, we're going to get right into our weekly updates so we can get to our main presentation because we have a lot of great stuff to cover today. So I'll turn it right over to Dr. Collins. So uh, quickly go through the numbers for COVID-19. Sorry, my internet's uh, choppy a little bit this morning. Um, so uh, as we all know, I think uh, hospitalizations continue to decline. Uh, both in the country, in the Bay Area, and here at Stanford. Um, so these are all uh, trends that we like to see. Uh, as far as demographics, um, we've updated them now through February 14th. Um, we've seen now uh, 1,704 patients with SARS-CoV-2 <clears throat> between Stanford and Stanford Valley Care, uh, of which 1,415 have been at Stanford uh, in Palo Alto. Uh, continue to see a rate of uh, around 22% of those who need ICU care at some point, and then uh, a mortality rate at or within 30 days of discharge of uh, just over 7%. Um, there we go. Uh, we also uh, quickly at, at our length of stay uh, and 30 day readmission numbers um, now through uh, mid February. Uh, length of stay is basically what we've seen before. Um, it hasn't really changed over time uh, with a median of 4.2 days and a mean of 7.4 days. Um, the chart on the top on the right is showing uh, the mean over time, um, basically showing that it stays the same. That, that dip at the end is, is artificial um, from patients still in the hospital. Um, and then for 30 day readmissions, uh, we've looked now uh, through mid-January to allow at least 30 days of follow-up after discharge. Uh, and we still show uh, around, it's been between nine and 10% when we've looked at it. Uh, it. It varies a little bit over time, but no clear trend. So it uh, seems like we're, we're roughly in that window in terms of uh, what we've seen. Um, and with that, I just wanna make sure I thank everyone who helps with these and I will turn it over to the next person. Excellent, uh, Dr. Collins, thank you as always. Uh, I just wanna briefly uh, mention that next week we have Dr. Rhea Boyd, who's gonna be talking with the title the Politics and of Representation on Diversity, Inclusion, and Justice. The week after that, we have uh, the kicking off of National Kidney Month uh, with Dr. Deja Cruz. And then the week after that, we have Dr. Shanna Felt, who's gonna be focusing on wellness. Uh, with that being said, I will turn it over to Dr. Harrington to introduce our speakers today. Great, uh, thank you, Errol, Errol. And thank you to all the panelists for uh, continuing to give the uh, Medical Grand Rounds community these, uh, these updates every week. Well, it's really a pleasure to introduce a, uh, a group of speakers uh, this morning who are going to continue to uh, help lead us in our celebration of, uh, of Black History Month throughout February. So thank you to, uh, to all of the speakers. Uh, I'm gonna introduce each of them briefly so that you have, the, uh, you, you have that information about them when they uh, are giving their presentation. First up in the presentation is uh, Dr. Carla Pugh. Uh, Dr. Pugh is a professor of surgery here at Stanford. We were fortunate in 2018 to recruit her from the University of Wisconsin, where she had really become known as an innovative educator. Uh, here at Stanford, she, in addition to being a professor of surgery, she is the director of the Technology Enabled Clinical Improvement Center. Some of you who regularly attend Medical Grand Rounds may recall that shortly after Dr. Pugh arrived at Stanford, she was sharing her research with us in an earlier Medical Grand Round. So welcome back, Dr. Pugh. Second up is uh, one of our own faculty members from the Department of Medicine, Dr. Hannah Valentine. Uh, many, if not most of you who uh, watch Medical Grand Rounds certainly know Hannah. She had a long career as a clinician investigator at Stanford before in 2014, moving to the NIH, where she was the NIH's first chief officer of scientific workforce diversity. We were fortunate throughout her tenure at NIH to welcome her back to campus on a variety of occasions. And uh, we were more pleased when she rejoined the Stanford community this past fall, where she serves as a professor of medicine uh, within the Department of Medicine as the Director of Team Science and as a senior advisor to me on a variety of issues, including team science and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, next up will be uh, Dr. Terrence Mays. Terrence is a national leader in uh, higher education, and we were fortunate recently to recruit him to Stanford, where he serves as the inaugural Associate Dean for Equity and Strategic Initiatives as well as serving as the executive director of the Commission on Justice and Equity at Stanford Medicine. 
So thank you, uh, Dr. Mays, for this leadership role at Stanford Medicine. And we look forward to welcome you to the Medical Grand Rounds community this morning. Uh, the last up in the speakers will actually serve as a moderator. Uh, Dr. Tamara Dunn is well known to the Medicine Grand Rounds um, community. Uh, in addition to being a member of our hematology faculty, uh, Tamara, Dr. Dunn also serves as the program director for the hematology fellowship program. And recently she has accepted the position for which I'm quite grateful to serve as the associate chair of diversity and inclusion in the Department of Medicine. So thank you, Dr. Dunn, for taking on that additional responsibility. I'm gonna now turn it over to Dr. Pugh, who's going to talk to us, start off the conversation on delivering on diversity, equity, and inclusion, moving beyond pipelines to accountability and measurable change. So Dr. Pugh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much uh, for the, the very kind introduction and thanks again for uh, having me back. Uh, as many of you remember, I was uh, here talking about my uh, research in sensor and motion technology and looking at uh, clinical skills performance. Uh, and this time I'm here to talk about DEI, and I openly admit this is not my area of research, so I brought um, two experts uh, in Hannah Valentine and Terrence Mays. This is their uh, career work, and, and uh, for me, it's, it's obviously a, a, a personal area which I am feverishly passionate about um, and have lived the experience. Um, but I think it's really important to look at the data and I will share some of the data with you that I have learned along the way. And I have to say the more that I learn myself, the more passionate I become. There are a number of things that I did not uh, realize in one statistic for me, that was very shocking uh, to learn this year um, is that I am one of 11 black female surgeons with NIH funding uh, tenure, similar numbers, and the, and the uh, AAMC publishes these tables separately. But it, it's kind of shocking to find out you're, you're one of a group where there's 11 people in the country, and it's just hard to get your, your head around that. Um, so those are the kind of things that, that fuel my passion, and I'll, I'll share a little bit. Our, our goal for today um, is really to share, uh, myself, Hannah, and Terrence will share for about 10 minutes, and we really look forward to an open discussion. I think that, that of all the DEI efforts, planning, strategy, what I am finding is, is creating a space to have an open conversation and a platform um, to share ideas and to, to be creative is what's most important right now as we begin uh, these efforts. I, just in line with the conversation about pipelines, um, I am the product of, of a pipe, multiple pipeline programs. Uh, I'm born and raised uh, here in uh, California, Berkeley, and um, went through pipeline programs and through high school, uh, college, and then, you know, now I'm in a, a surgeon, you know, coming through medical school. And I, I think that these programs are extremely important. Um, Stanford has over 25, Stanford Medicine alone, not the broader campus, but Stanford Medicine alone has over 25 programs, which are absolutely amazing. Uh, and obviously, uh, your own department um, houses uh, a very successful program. And, and thank you all. Um, I know that it, it's a lot of work um, and a huge commitment. And, uh, but I also know that it's extremely beneficial and, and it's extremely important for us to continue uh, with these programs and, and develop more if necessary in terms as we learn you know, the, the gaps that we need to uh, focus on. The positive thing about this is that they're actually working, and we don't hear a lot about this, I guess, just in general, but when you look at the numbers here, uh, from 2016 to 2021, um, in each of the categories of URM, uh, the numbers have been increasing. Um, African American from, you know, over close to 6,000 to now over 7,000. Hispanics, the same uh, 
Hawaiian, uh, I think, you know, and other multiple ethnicity, these numbers, and I think people are starting to uh, identify and change how they categorize themselves. Um, but it is notable for me, just in looking at this number, that the number of, of white uh, students that are enrolling in medical school is declining. And that can be just a first glance at that, that data without knowing or, or understanding this, whether this is their choice for other professions or whether, you know, we're evening out uh, the numbers. But, you know, if you look at this, this can also be a point um, of discussion for others who feel that they are sort of being pushed out. And I think we have to talk about these things openly. Having said that, again, uh, you know, uh, there's still a lot of work. Um, when you look at these numbers, there is an increase. Um, however, you know, Black and African Americans are still 4.5% um, of the physicians um, and 13% of the population. So we still have work to do, but the programs are successful. I think that where there is a lot of work that needs to be done um, beyond the pipeline is the dismissal. Uh, and this is a data that came from the ACGME. Um, it, is, it is dated, um, but what's interesting is that this is not data that the ACGME regularly publish. Um, and they only made it public in 2019. This was a research project um, uh, that is no longer in existence, and I, and I have spoken with them. Uh, the leaders, the DEI leaders at the ACGME are now um, seeking funding to look at the data to see, you know, what the numbers look like now. But putting it in perspective, again, Blacks are 4.5% of the, the pipeline grads as well as physicians, but they're 25% um, of those who are dismissed. And when you look at each of the most common specialties, um, looking at the dismissal numbers, um, it's, it's humbling to, to see Hispanics and Blacks being dismissed at a rate two times, four times, and in my own profession, in surgery six times more likely uh, than their counterparts. And um, I've shared this data um, a few times, and it's... Um, Interesting to, to put this in perspective. These are not, these are residents who achieved the criteria. They got the USMLE scores. They got honors in their rotation. They passed the interview and were accepted into the program. So when we look at this data, um, I don't think that this is, a time to have a conversation about um, meeting standards. Um, and again, this, you know, when I've shared this data, I've had a number of very interesting questions and conversations raised, which lets me know that we need to, to talk about this more. And we're definitely awaiting um, updated data from the ACGME. Um, but when you look at their overall data, the, the overall dismissal numbers really haven't changed. Um, and so I think that there is, there is work to be done. Um, when I speak at a national level, um, and I've been invited uh, to speak at a number of different departments, uh, many of them openly, you know, admit that they, before, you know, um, this new era of Black Lives Matter and uh, focusing on, on DEI and starting to look at this, the numbers, before this national level awareness, most programs did not think that they had a problem, uh, including a number of programs at Stanford. And just in creating a platform to hear from their residents, um, people are learning that they, there was a lot more going on than they would ever know. So how does this happen? Uh, and I think it, it is, uh, a time for us to evaluate the workplace. Um, it's the structural things that we don't talk about. Um, and more specifically, a culture of belonging. And uh, 
these are some of the, the data that are coming out, that a single incidence of micro-exclusion can lead to an immediate 25% decline in an individual's performance. Um, workplace belonging on the positive side uh, can lead to 56% increase in job performance, 50% reduction in turnover, 75% um, decrease in, in sick days. Um, obviously, this is in the business sector and they, they've done a lot more work in looking at this, but I, I think this is this relates to the human existence and human behavior and, and I um, would be led to believe that this statistics would likely be similar um, for us in healthcare. Uh, just a quick list of things that I've learned and then I will hand it over to Hannah. Um, a glance at, at Stanford Medicine. Um, I am lucky enough to be part of the Stanford Commission, and I will leave uh, it to Terrence to give some updates on the things that we're learning. I'm also part of the uh, cluster hire um, at the university level and working with Persis Drell um, as part of the um, IDEAL program. And I think that what I am learning is that we talk a lot about increasing our numbers, which is actually one of the, the, the first goals that we have to address at Stanford. When you go back and look at that ACGME data, um, I did check in to see what our numbers look like at Stanford. And the reality is that we don't have enough data to, to, to generate. We don't have enough black and brown um, residents to, to really take a good look at the numbers. So the recruitment is important, um, but again, uh, when we recruit, we really do have to look at what happens in the workplace. Um, what has happened to those who left Stanford? Um, what I've learned from the trainees is that um, they don't think that we have a trusted platform for them to share. And many of them fear backlash, fear being labeled. And for them, they're here for a short-term experience and they want their main goal is to get a fellowship and to get a job and they don't want to be labeled. So they're not willing to speak up about the things that they experience daily in the hospital. And I think that's one other thing we should talk about. It's one thing to belong to a department and to have some feelings of belonging in a department. But the reality is that most of our residents and faculty spend most of their time in the hospital and that's a different place. And then they go into their community to try to find um, an apartment and um, have other experiences. And these are things that are not shared openly. Um, from a team member perspective, I think we have to ask questions. Um, how are mistakes viewed? Um, how are contributions valued? Um, and from accountability perspective, how do we really formalize um, workplace efforts to raise these questions to establish a platform? Um, and I, I think that uh, there's a lot of work to do I will make a shameless plug to you all. I'm giving a talk um, on an experience that I've had, a number of experiences that I've had in the hospital um, here at Stanford, um, but I've actually got some of the people who I've had the experience with to partner with me. And so this is happening next week on Monday, if any of you have a chance to attend. Um, again, I, I think having a platform and a conversation is extremely important. I will hand it over to Hannah, who will talk to us. Um, about accountability. Thank you so very much, uh, Carla, for setting the stage so wonderfully. I am going to be uh, focusing on this issue of accountability uh, because I think it's a really a path forward uh, that will en enable even greater success in the existing programs. Um, you painted a wonderful picture showing the data uh, around um, the um, uh, how little we have diversity in the faculty. And it's, uh, I sometimes make the analogy to a huge proximal coronary stenosis. We have a reasonable pipeline, not perfect, but reasonable, but that, that there is that chasm as uh, people move on to the, uh, that transition from a training into the faculty position. And this slide really depicts this. You're not supposed to read the absolute data details, but when showing the representation on the vertical axis of various um, groups as you move along 
the career path from a very from a bachelor's degree right through to leadership. And what you can see here is that most of the the color codes that women that are classically under from classically underrepresented groups that is to say Hispanic, African American, uh, American Indian, Pacific Islander, uh, a Native Hawaiian. That group they decrease consistently uh, to be minuscule at leadership levels. And some argue that perhaps this is just a cohort effect. Wait until things will get better. But the group in green are women from well-represented groups, that is to say, white and Asian, we see this constant de de diminution in their representation. And I would argue that it is something to do with our culture, as Cal Carla has, uh, 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 has painted the picture for us. And my question really, I think it's timely for us to ask whether academic institutions can achieve this equity uh, in both diversity, that's the numbers and inclusion, which is that sense of belonging in the workplace. And at least from the point of view of uh, equity in the numbers, I believe we can, and I believe that Stanford can make a, a major inroad very rapidly because it has already done it for one particular groups that is uh, the uh, representation of women chairs, uh, in department chairs. What I'm showing you here is our peer institutions, top um, 10 uh, US News and World Report for research. And what you can see here is that um, at the time when I made this evaluation in 2019, Stanford was a uh, representation of chairs was 37% uh, and now it's 47%. And uh, whereas most uh, areas it is 20%. Now, if gender parity can be achieved, then our goal has to be uh, the uh, to be a focus on racial equity. And I believe we can do that. The problem is that most of our programs in the past have focused on the individual mentoring, uh, career development, and these are absolutely vital, should not stop, should go on. They are necessary, but not sufficient. And what we really need now is the addition of interventions at the institutional level. level. And these kinds of interventions, at the core of them, would be to promote transparency and accountability. What do I mean by that? We need to have a systematic review and transparency of our hiring and promotion uh, procedures and our policies. When we collect the data, it must be not only just aggregated but disaggregated by departments. And um, uh, you know, d diversity uh, professionals like myself uh, can't keep wagging the finger at others and say, you must do better. It is our job to provide those tools so that departments can, uh, can actually do this work. And all the way along, we must be evaluating impact. But about the most important thing, if I can leave that with you, is that we must tie these uh, behaviors that we seek to, uh, to establish, we must link them to institutional values and reward systems. And notice I say reward, not award, Many of us have lots of uh, plaques and uh, $50 gift certificates. This is not what I mean. I'm meaning the actual reward systems of an institution. So what is the path to go get there? I've put down six bullet areas for which I have some evidence. These are not randomized controlled trials, but that, that these are effective strategies. We must first be, I have a way of identifying a diverse talent pool for um, our applications to our positions. Very often we all go to our, uh, our own networks and basically what that means going to the same pool of people. That's needed, but we must also have a systematic approach where we might look at use uh, databases, we might use uh, 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 social media tools to actually get to those people who uh, would not necessarily be applying to our positions. We must, uh, the other approach is for trans-institutional searches for faculty positions. 
so that this might be run two or three times a year. And that way you have an opportunity of seeing a much more broad uh, pool. And then thirdly, we must have um, approaches that are really geared to changing the culture. For example, hiring groups of faculty in cohorts. Um, the cluster hire that Carla re re referred to is one way of doing that. And then creating programs to support them. It's almost like the, getting the right seed and preparing the soil so that they can flourish. And, it, and that means creating a culture of inclusion and mentoring. And as an example of this uh, focus searched on bias search, at NIH, um, when we were looking for uh, positions for junior faculty, we had a couple of people in my office that really just did the broad search for us to identify candidates. And really very short and over a very short period of a couple of years, we had amassed a group of about a thousand uh, people who were highly qualified for junior career positions publishing well in top journals, and look at the diversity of that group. 25% uh, Hispanic, 25% African American, and uh, greater than 50% women. Here's some data around the, um, the uh, uh, cluster hiring and the cohort hiring. Uh, what you can see here is that when we started doing the, um, the uh, trans NIH searches, we call them the Stadman and the Alaska. You can see a slight increase in the numbers of uh, the percentage of the underrepresented faculty, that is to say Hispanic, uh, African-American and uh, American Indian. But look at that hockey stick type uh, shift of the curve just after two years with this Distinguished Scholar, uh, Scholars Program. And I'm, I'm very excited to hear about what's gonna happen in, this, uh, in the national uh, version of this, which we call the first program. Similar impact of these two strategies, trans-institutional uh, search, and then the cluster hire on the representation of women going from 35% uh, uh, right through to 45% very uh, rapidly. Implicit bias and racism is key uh, to a lot of this. And it has impacts not only on the individual, but on the institution. And here is a list of the devastating effects of, um, of implicit bias and racism on the individuals. This is our colleagues, all of us, going through this every day, feeling of isolation, overly burdened by service on mentoring committees and, and many other service in ways that are not actually valued in the promotions uh, uh, procedures, uh, racial uh, and sexual harassment, microaggressions, and then that terrible worry, that feeling of fulfilling a negative stereotype associated with one's identity group, which is called stereotype threat, and the consequence of that imposter syndrome whereby your performance actually goes down because you're this elevated anxiety level. And then being very hyper vigilant about errors and failures because of being in the spotlight. And on a, on a more institutional basis, this is a, a much recommended reading. We know that bias exists extraordinarily across many very well designed studies have shown that exists in scientific workforce diversity, hiring and promotions, peer review, grading of faculty by students. I've seen many really successful career derailed by unfair gradings from students um, based on, an, uh, on race. And there is the science behind uh, this. Do any study you like about salaries and you will find a, a gender gap in salaries and a, a absolute uh, important to keep an eye on it. And when we do all these things in a transparent manner, people, the faculty then get a sense that this is a, a, an equitable environment and that feeds into that sense of belonging. Um, there are many tools out there. Uh, this is a completely separate uh, talk about how we reduce those biases. 
But just to summarize, raising awareness, and I put down here the uh, references, very well designed studies to show that these uh, strategies work, broadening the images of success. When you walk down a, a, a path in most hospital settings on the walls, there are just uh, images of white men and that instantly sends a message that one doesn't belong. Consistency in judgment uh, in the evaluation criteria and avoiding ambiguity and time pressure when we make these important decisions. And this helps us not to, uh, to slip back into our stereotypes. And then practicing speaking up uh, when we perceive bias, which is referred to as a bias interrupter. And then the accountability piece is critical for transparency, tracking data and incentivizing behavior. And at NIH, we set up a committee which is chaired by a senior uh, faculty member with um, uh, attention to diversity on the people on the committee. And then this committee meets uh, monthly to get the uh, reports from each institute that would be the equivalent of a department separately, whereby the institute director, a uh, scientific director comes and presents their data uh, we evaluate it ahead of time and look for gaps. And uh, most people, when we think of metrics, think of de de demographic data, but that's not where we stop. We uh, evaluate salaries, resources for research, resources for administration, because we hear that there could there is a, a, a gap, equity gap there as well, and resources for clinical support. Also important to evaluate is the diversity in the promotion and tenure committees, the real diversity and the committee's anti-bias training. And then we uh, evaluate that and send them back to correct the gaps that we see. And then we also uh, look to see what are they actually doing to promote diversity and inclusion? What is the diversity in their speaker series? Are they have uh, in, uh, department-wide awareness uh, of implicit bias training? What are the best practices that they're using in their individual searches? So a lot of metrics, and we, you can then put this on a dashboard so that each department can see what the other's doing and draw on the best practices that are uh, effective. And I will close by then by really going back to this importance of this feeling of not being uh, included um, as our great uh, poet and uh, at storyteller, Maya Angela reminded us, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And it's that feeling of not belonging that I think is creating that massive gap and driving people away from our uh, wonderful career paths here. And so I hope that you all have taken note that contrary to the usual uh, saying that great minds think different uh, alike, we really want that co collection of different ways of thinking in order to enhance our science, our research, our patient care, and create this, um, this inclusive environment. And we cannot solve the problems with the same thinking we use when we created them, as said by the great um, uh, 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 scientist, Albert Einstein. And I'll stop now and stop, share and, uh, stop sharing my screen. Over back to you, Carla. Thanks, Anna. Thank you so much. That was a, a wonderful and very informative. And now we will hear from parents and then move on to the discussion. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And, and I'll try to be brief um, so that we can get to the discussion. First off, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Happy Black History Month. Um, you know, this has been an incredibly uh, traumatic uh, several months for, for all of us, for everyone, but I think especially for Black people. Uh, in our nation. And so um, I feel like Black History Month this year uh, has taken on special meaning uh, in many ways, this opportunity to celebrate 
uh, Black culture and, and the contributions of Black people uh, in, in our country really couldn't be more uh, timely and needed. And I also want to applaud uh, the department, uh, Department of Medicine, for really focusing your grand rounds uh, this month on, on diverse uh, voices and, and diverse narratives. Um, so today's discussion is focused on accountability and, and measurable change, uh, as, as my colleagues have, have been uh, discussing. And I thought it might be fitting for um, me to provide you all with an update on the Commission on Justice uh, and Equity, um, which, as you all know, launched uh, this past fall. Uh, but before, before I do that, before I, I give you an update on the Commission, um, I'd like to offer just a bit of, of grounding, okay? Um, you know, in the, in the summer uh, last year, we, we all mourned the death of George Floyd. Um, and unfortunately for, uh, for many in this country, and, and I think even on this campus, um, there are those who believe or believe that our struggle uh, around racial injustice um, started with the murder of George Floyd. You know, we started hearing phrases like, you know, we're in a national reckoning on race, we're amidst a, a great uh, awakening. And I think it's important to acknowledge that for some of us, we, we sort of lack the privilege of, of not being, uh, you know, constantly uh, aware and awakened to the ever present uh, realities um, of racism. And I think it's also important to recognize that Black people in this country have suffered under the weight of racism, um, systemic racism for centuries, right? And, you know, what you're seeing on your screen uh, right now is a snapshot, right, of, of racialized injustices and violence uh, enacted against Black people um, since the United States was colonized. And, you know, this certainly isn't an exhaustive list, right? Um, but perhaps what it does is um, helps to explain why uh, many Black people and, and Black uh, allies, other people of color, are so frustrated, right? Um, angry, uh, even, because um, Black people and other people of color uh, in this country have been fighting for equality, fighting for justice, fighting for equity, uh, for so long uh, with very little progress. And, you know, let's look at our history, you know, American history, um, the last 400 years or so, uh, over 300 years of which uh, Black people were held in bondage, right, in our country, viewed and treated as, as property. And if you want to make the argument that we have relative equality now, um, which I might take issue with, but for the sake of argument, if you wanted to claim that, you would also have to recognize that this equality has only been around for about 50 years or so, right? And, you know, even if it's been around for over 100 years, we, we know that the trauma um, of slavery, the, the power of oppression uh, persists uh, through generations. Right. And so uh, when, uh, when Dean Miner and uh, CEOs, you know, David Inwistle, Paul King, uh, when they came together to issue their pledge uh, on June 5th uh, to the Stanford Medicine community just a few days after uh, George Floyd's passing, um, a pledge in which they declared, you know, enough is enough will use our influence to affect change. You know, they weren't just addressing uh, contemporary, you know, recent issues. You know, whether they knew it or not, they were speaking to 400 years of racial injustice in our country and an academic medical institution that was born out of that. So following up on, on, on their pledge a few weeks later that the three leaders uh, announced the formation of the Stanford Medicine Commission on Justice and Equity. And, and they gave us um, a sort of twofold charge, right? You know, the first was, you know, with 
our community's input, broad uh, input from the community, you know, recommend ways in which uh, Stanford medicine can strengthen, uh, revamp its institutional culture, or organizational culture, uh, in order to become more anti-racist, in order to develop a culture in which everyone, including those who have been underrepresented and, and, and left out, um, have an opportunity to thrive. And secondly, uh, you know, the, the charge was, you know, as an academic medical center, lean into our responsibility to uh, address health disparities uh, and, and close uh, the health disparity gaps that many marginalized groups face and, and really assert a national role uh, in health equity. So uh, the commission, uh, which launched this past fall, as I, as I mentioned, is comprised of a diverse group of stakeholders, both external and internal. It just so happens that both Carla and Hannah are on uh, the commission. And so you just heard from them for a few minutes. And so you can imagine how fortunate we are as an institution to have their dedicated attention uh, to this issue and, and really focusing on how to create a more just environment here at Stanford. And they've been doing this work. We've been doing this work. Uh, for several uh, months now. Uh, in terms of timeline, you know, again, as I mentioned, we launched uh, in the fall um, and we've committed to conducting our work over a span of about six months. Um, you know, we spent really all of the fall and, and part of the winter in an in intensive uh, learning phase and, you know, listening to the stories uh, uh, members of our community, the narratives, you know, the everyday uh, experiences, especially those who are in our BIPOC communities, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color. Um, and we really took our time at this stage because we feel strongly that, you know, in order to address systemic uh, racism, you know, we have to take a hard look within, an honest look, uh, an authentic look uh, within. And I can tell you, you know, we, we heard some really raw and powerful narratives. Some were fairly difficult to hear uh, about the experiences, the everyday experiences of people of color in particular within Stanford uh, medicine. And so while uh, the commission has yet uh, to uh, issue our set of recommendations. Uh, I wish I could have broken news uh, this morning uh, with you all around our, uh, what we hope will be really bold uh, recommendations um, geared towards transforming our culture. We're, we're not quite there yet. Um, but where we, what we have done and, and where we are in our process is that we have developed a set of um, early themes, themes that have sort of emerged um, out of our listening sessions and, and, and um, themes in which we are now organizing our deliberation and ultimately uh, our recommendations, recommendations that you will see uh, by early spring. And so I wanna go through these just really briefly and, and then we'll get into some discussion. You know, the first category is really speaking to organ organizational uh, capability to do, uh, you know, to really uh, fulfill our, our mission around diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, we heard from many members of the community that uh, while we have a number of really strong, great efforts, you know, pipeline programs, diversity programs throughout uh, the organization, uh, one of the challenges is that these efforts are very siloed, um, you know, reflective of the decentralized nature of our institution, um, and so we're not really getting the, the, the maximum impact that we could possibly get if we were better aligned and we have sort of a unified vision around uh, this work. And so this part of the commission's work is really focused on, you know, how do we build visionary uh, and coordinated organizational DEI uh, capability? And then on people and culture, you know, as, as uh, Hannah alluded to, you know, we have made some progress as it relates to diversity. That, that is clear. Look at the gender uh, diversity in our faculty. Look at the diversity in our student body. Um, but what's also clear is that we still have a lot of work to do. Um, underrepresented minorities in our faculty has remained flat, flat at around six to seven percent for decades. Okay, not years, but for decades. So this is our reality. It's been our reality 
uh, for far too long. And so this part of the commission's work is focused on, you know, how do we ensure parity at all levels as it relates to race ethnicity uh, within uh, Stanford Medicine, uh, but also how do we create an environment, a culture, right, in which those individuals and everyone else uh, is able to show up as their full selves and, and really thrive. And then what I'll say on health equity, um, you know, I think it's well established now uh, that BIPOC individuals in our country have faced a number of health related disparities and the recent uh, pandemic has, has drawn this into much sharper uh, focus. Um, what the commission has heard though, is that, um, you know, although the, the Dean and, and CEOs have, have sort of charged us with um, making recommendations around how do we assert national leadership on this issue, what's clear to the commission is that we first need to figure out how to assert local leadership, meaning we really need to sort of look into our own backyard, build trust within our own local communities, and work to narrow those health equity gaps within our own uh, patient community before uh, we can serve as, as a model uh, for the rest of the country and the rest of the world. And then this final uh, part of our work will be around accountability. It's what we're here to talk about today. Uh, and, it, and it really underpins, I think, um, and is critical to Stanford Medicine's aspiration to become a more just uh, and equitable environment. And, um, you know, institutional accountability is important as both Carla and, and Hannah uh, spoke so eloquently to, but individual accountability is also important. So the recommendations will be around how do we ensure that each person within our Stanford community has an opportunity or even the expectation, I should say, to contribute to our equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice mission. So I'll pause there uh, and, and hand it over to Dr. Dunn uh, for Q&A. Thank you, Karen. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Mays, Dr. Valentine, and Dr. Pugh. First of all, I'm overjoyed that our department has supported our efforts to celebrate Black voices during this Black History Month, which as Dr. Mays alluded to, is historic really in how we're approaching and looking at race and ethnicity and um, structural racism and, and creating an anti-racist environment. And so that's very different the way that we have, have um, framed it and discussed it than in years past. And I'm really pleased to be a part of it. And the talks to, to this date have been incredible. So thank you all to all the panelists for contributing to that. Um, we have quite a few questions in the Q&A, and so let's get to some of those. Um, number one, I'll talk a little bit about tenure because we've had a couple of questions come up about that. Uh, Greg Kovacs would like to know how the idea of tenure affects the pipeline, saying that, you know, since they are lifetime appointments for professors, that certainly affects the turnover time. And along those lines, I will also go ahead and integrate Kathy Garza's um, question for doctors Pugh and Valentine and asking about commenting on Stanford specific recruitment and tenure reappointment procedures and any changes that either of you might recommend for that. Well, I did notice the uh, comment in the chat and I responded. Um, I do think that, um, uh, you know, uh, tenure uh, was um, of a time and um, it has some uh, important uh, issues that support the university and support our mission, but there are certain limitations when, when, it, was cons uh, when it was construed, it, there were these other important factors were not taken into account. And I, I would argue that diversity and inclusion activities is not valued and rewarded in that process. And this is, um, you know, we're using the old kind of thinking to uh, to solve new issues, uh, relatively new issues, and that won't work. So I, uh, we need to relook at the uh, a &P procedures. In fact, I put a note in that, the, you know, the uh, cohort hiring uh, process, the applicants actually had to describe what they had done in support of diversity and inclusion. It was not a selection based on race. 
And it was based on the evaluation of that, of course, in addition to the academic excellence and research, that they were ultimately selected. So modifications of those processes, I think, is critical uh, if we are going to achieve this culture shift uh, that we all seek. Great, thank you. Um, we got an anonymous question. Uh, how do we have better transparency in communications and understanding without being labeled when we speak our opinion in what is supposed to be a safe, um, a safe space, but we re receive backlash. I love this question, and I think it's so so important to educate both sides. Um, I, yeah, I think that that we have unfortunately set ourselves up for failure, um, especially if you watch the news, and it doesn't matter whether you're watching CNN, MSNBC, or Fox News. I mean, the conversation that is taking place. It's not a conversation. It is a complete violation of elementary school playground rules. It, it you know, to to resort to name calling and call, labeling people as liars, uh, even in this conversation, nobody wants to be called a racist. I think that in the same vein, when you when you see that type of language being used, we as adults actually have to revert back to what our mothers and fathers told us, you know, sticks and stones, right? I mean, people, it, I, I think that you have to look back at, you know, why is this happening? Look at it from that person's perspective. They are labeling me out of fear. And then not take it personal, because in that moment, it's actually really not about you. On both sides, I think we both, we have not established a, any rules of engagement to have this conversation. And that is actually the huge opportunity that Stanford has. We have the scholars. We have the scholars that understand both sides, the pain, the, the guilt, the lack of guilt, the why do you care? I mean, and I also think it's unrealistic to paint a picture for people of color that, you know, we'll have these conversations and we'll do all these things and all will be well. It will not. There are generations of people who will not accept us, but there, it's not as many as we think. And I, and I think that, again, I can't underscore it, setting the rules of engagement, creating a platform to have these conversations and know that they will be difficult. It will be difficult for both sides and we accept it, but at the end of the day, we're, we're all human beings. And when we work together towards a goal, great, and we're trusting great. that everyone cares about it, yeah, and, we and can I, get there. If I could just add to that really briefly, uh, because I think uh, Dr. Key put that so well, you know, this is uh, and has been a uh, really key focus of the Commission on Justice and Equity you know, how to create a safe uh, environment here at Stanford Medicine uh, for everyone, um, an environment where everyone feels like they belong um, and they feel valued. Um, and, and I really think the key here is to be really clear about our institutional values, uh, be, you know, be unapologetic about our institutional values and hold everyone accountable uh, to, to those values, you know. Um, you know, one of the challenges in, in addressing uh, racism, uh, for instance, uh, in our environment is that, you know, the, the more overt forms of racism that we uh, saw uh, decades ago, um, you know, use, use some N-words and things like that, you know, research suggests that that type of racism is, is on the decline or has been on the decline for a number of years now, but there's this more subtle a form of, of racism and discrimination uh, that is actually on the rise. And Hannah spoke uh, to, to some of this, you know, microaggressions and, and bias and, and the minority tax. And we really need to take a hard look at some of these subtle um, threats uh, in our environment and figure out how to eradicate them in order to create a more inclusive environment. Tamara, if I could just add a point, I really resonate with both 
Carla and Terence are talking about and creating this safe space to, to speak openly, critically important, the behavioral science have taught us that that certainly is an important part. But the other thing that behavioral science has taught us is that if we want behavior change, it's gotta be incentivized. And I worry that we could be, have these wonderful areas, uh, soft, uh, platforms for you know, discussion and it stays as discussion and it doesn't can, uh, evoke change. And uh, maybe it's my age, I'm impatient for change <laughs> to occur. And I think the fastest way there is to incentivize it. Great, thank you, Dr. Valentine. I think all of those are very important points. And you know, interestingly, if we recall last week, Dr. Capers mentioned having somewhat of a racial bias m m and I think that that is truly a wonderful idea and something that Wendy and I will talk about how we could try to implement that into our department because I think that's a really important um, point um, in, in, in helping people find a place that they can express something that has happened to them. So um, Shauna Fullis says, thanks for a great talk and exciting path to move forward. What is the role of class in DEI efforts considering the co-occurring impact in, in intersectionality of race, class, and gender in the US? I think the most important thing that runs through all of this is that actually Trump's, excuse the pun, uh, class is caste. And if any of you have read the wonderful book, uh, Caste, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, and I think it, we really, need to focus on how do we eliminate and uh, remove these um, these underlying currencies that that result in a uh, thinking around caste as opposed to uh, uh, class. Great, thank you. Um, Jessica Moon asks if we have measured inclusion um, in our department. I'll, I'll take part of that on actually, just because we're in the process of speaking to all of the black, self-identifying black and uh, African faculty um, in the it, throughout the School of Medicine. And we'll be talking about their experiences and um, some of their successes and challenges. So hoping to get a handle on that in the near future. Okay. So Deanna Grenier Mullins says, I so appreciate this conversation. I can look back and see times and situations where my automatic reactions were rooted in unconscious bias. Though at a time, at the time I was very entrenched and defended. I am grateful to be able to learn to increasingly unplug from those automatic reactions. So just speaking a little bit about implicit bias, unconscious bias. Um, Edward Leibowitz, Dr. Valentine, would like to know what specific incentives you would suggest? Yeah, um, first of all, um, one of the, uh, we should look at models of incentives that have worked. Uh, the classic is at Intel, it's not an academic institution, but when they incentivize uh, and created bonuses for their top executives for hiring more women, guess what? Uh, Intel became the most uh, acclaimed uh, uh, organization for gender diversity. Uh, so um, it, having it be part of the evaluation of the performance of leadership, leadership and leaders within the institution um, by uh, whatever way possible. One is obviously, you know, uh, money and space show me a department chair that doesn't care about money and space. <laughs> so um, uh, that's rather tongue in cheek, but you know, they are, we can find uh, those uh, incentives. And then uh, within the, um, within the ANP process, having it be something that is not an afterthought, but really evaluated critically uh, as one's scholarship is, as one's teaching is, one's evaluations. Uh, those are the kinds of 
incentivizing um, methods, I think, are ready for, for testing. They may not work. I, you know, I'm a scientist, I have an open mind, but I think they're worthy of testing at this point. And they haven't been. That approach is notoriously absent from this DI, DEI work. Great, thank you, Dr. Valentine. I know we're over, we're gonna have one more question and then um, we really appreciate you all um, tuning into today's Grand Rounds. Uh, Bertha Villa asked, do you believe that to provide a platform leveling the playing field, we must go into communities to address disparities? And how do we increase the pool of diverse applicants without reaching out in early educational development? I, we, ha we can't. Uh, you know, we, we have to um, continue uh, to reach out at the earliest levels to inspire uh, the next um, generation. Um, you know, if you come from a community uh, like the one that I came from, sometimes you don't really know what you can aspire to um, unless you're exposed uh, to uh, various possibilities. I could come in the form of mentors, uh, that can come in the form of the pipeline programs that, that, that we have. Uh, but those are critical, as, uh, as uh, Carla mentioned uh, earlier, they're, they're working. Uh, and we've been doing that for many, many years. We need to continue that work. And in fact, we need to expand uh, that work. So I, I forget the first part of your question, but maybe I'll, I'll let Carla or Hannah uh, respond to that first part. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Terrence. I, I think, um, I think, I think, you know, I think about, again, my time, um, you know, I grew up watching Marcus Welby, um, and that was the only physician on TV. I'm dating myself. Um, but now you see, you see physicians of color, you see women who are physicians. And, and again, I think, I think it's important to continue these programs and, and allow, um, you know, students in high school, elementary school to know and see that there are women and um, black and brown people who are physicians, physician scientists. But I, I still believe that the, the, the work we need to do is, is uh, on the retention side. And I know someone said, you know, it's harder to get the metrics there, but I think that there, there, is, there are surveys, there's our, this is a wellness issue um, I think that there are frameworks that we can adopt that will help us to, to get at some of the, the soft science that actually is hurting us um, uh, around a culture of belonging that's hurting us the most right now. So just a quick uh, addition to that. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. In as much as I really push for faculty diversity, I'm not saying we mustn't do that work of the pipeline that goes way back to early education is it feels like we lose people at every stage so so critically important and, and but i think we 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 need to be able to measure inclusion and it has been actually there is a faculty climate survey that has many questions on it for inclusion that's run at stanford every three or four years uh, the problem is that those results are not disseminated and actually really a big action taken around them. There was um, a, an interview survey um, in, uh, I think it must have been uh, 2012, where all of the black faculty were interviewed anonymously and gave fantastic input. And the, the, the data was analyzed by social scientists and important recommendations. I'm not hearing what was done with that. So um, we, we really, uh, we need to not only do these surveys and measure, but then move to action. I think this is the time for action. Wonderful. On that note, it is 9.08. So we'll be wrapping up our grand rounds today. Um, thank you so much to Drs. Valentine, Dr. Mays and Dr. Pugh for their incredible contributions. And we look forward to seeing everyone next week for Dr. Rhea Boyd. Dr. Dunn, I just want to say thank you to you. And you certainly have an open invitation to moderate any grand rounds you'd ever like and welcome it very much. So I'm going to bug you about that. Thank you, everybody, our presenters uh, and for our updaters and for everybody for joining. Thanks, Dr. Harrington. Have a great day and week. Thank you. Happy Black History Month. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity.